Again, we're going to continue to look together in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, it's a book that most pastors, most Bible teachers stay pretty far away from. They might pick a verse now and then that appeals to them, but insofar as really trying to understand the book of Jeremiah, it's not a very happy book because it talks about the judgment of God and the judgment of God and the judgment of God and so uh, people stay pretty far from it. There's another reason of course for this and that is that it's very difficult to understand and uh, uh, the reason it's difficult to understand is because uh, we're learning that it has to do with the great tribulation for those who have tried to understand Jeremiah in the past have been able to, of course to learn certain fun, uh, truths from it uh, how God operates uh, in the past and so on but insofar as really understanding what it is uh, driving at uh, no they were unable to do that and that wasn't any fault of their diligence or their spirituality or anything of that nature it just wasn't time but now that we're living in the end time in that time of great tribulation as we go back through the Bible and pick up verses that previously were very difficult to understand now suddenly we're finding they're opening up and we're beginning to see that uh, that there's a lot more there than we ever suspected and this is very true of the whole book of Jeremiah now we've been looking in Jeremiah 6 and and that as well as all the chapters that went before are very very pertinent to today in verse 4 prepare ye war against her arise and let us go up at noon woe unto us for the day goeth away for the shadows of the evening are stretched out in uh, 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 in the next phrase let us go up at noon for woe unto us for the day goeth away now that is a very curious phrase remember God has written it it's crafted by God it's not there accidentally the day goeth away and so while we can say well that's really easy to see the sun has darkened and so the day is coming to an end nighttime is here yes that is one understanding of this certainly it is an understanding of this that now it is nighttime uh, and and in fact we know that uh, nighttime signifies no light of the gospel the gospel is out of the congregations but there's another sense here that is uh, that is uh, suggested already in, in Amos chapter 8 where we were reading the day goeth away who is the day Remember Psalm 118? Let's refresh our memory about that for just a moment. In Psalm 118, where God says in, uh, in verse 22 of Psalm 118, the stone which the builders refused has become the head of the stone, the headstone of the corner. Who is that? Who is that? The New Testament clearly shows us that is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in him. Yet he is the day. Christ is the day. And so there is therefore uh, uh, properly we can understand that in, uh, in Jeremiah 6, for the day goeth away, it means Christ is departing. Now, only because we have a whole lot of other verses in the Bible that teach the same thing would we dare to say this. But we know that from Second Thessalonians 2, that the Holy Spirit is no longer in the midst. We have read other passages where there, the, uh, there is no Son of Man there any longer. Uh, and, and the fact that Christ has left. Christ has departed and that is why it says here woe unto us because what is a congregation if Christ is not present if Christ is not there to apply the Word of God to the lives and hearts of those who are listening it is dead in fact it's worse than death it is bringing death because those who are there are, are, are 
are thinking, they're under the impression we're under the hearing of the Word. And therefore, God will bless this Word to our children. God will bless this Word to our lives in some way. And so everything is well. Uh, so we are conned, we are deceived into thinking that we have found a right answer when actually all that is there is death. Death. Because the day has departed. The Lord Jesus Christ has left. He's no longer there anymore. And then it goes on, for the shadows of the evening are stretched out. And it's a... I don't know the full meaning of this phrase, but I do know this, that as the day goes down, the shadows get longer and longer because the sun is getting close to the horizon and it's headed for night. And at least we can understand here the shadows of the evening are stretched out is pointing to the fact that night is here. Night is here. The day is gone. What is the purpose of the church throughout the church age? The purpose of the local congregation is to be the light of the world. It is to herald the Son of Christ who rises with healing in his wings, uh, the, uh, the Son who is Christ, S-U-N. Uh, it is to, uh, to bring the light of the gospel, the light of the truth of the Word of God. And when all of that no longer is effective, because God has departed from that congregation, it is dismal. It is a terrible, terrible situation. The only thing that counterbalances this negative kind of teaching is that the rest, there are other parts of the Bible we know. There is still the latter rain. Isn't that wonderful? Well, and then it goes on in verse 5. Now God begins to talk. Uh, to uh, begin to uh, uh, set forth his strategy, his strategy. Arise and let us go by night and let us destroy her palaces. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, for, for thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. And again, God is focusing the fact on the, the or, is, or focusing on Jerusalem as the target, as the target. You know, when we think about Jerusalem, when God talks about Jerusalem, is He only talking about the city of Jerusalem two thousand years ago? No, Jerusalem. This passage is 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 for us today and where is Jerusalem we're not talking about that city alongside the Mediterranean Sea where is Jerusalem what other Jerusalem could there be and it can only be the body of where the body of believers should be found I remember when I grew up I belonged to a church where most of the churches and where the the uh, main uh, uh, denominational officers were located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we used to kid about that, just just yeah, jokingly in a way. We said, that's Jerusalem, because that is where all of, uh, most of the theologians are. That's where our seminary is. There is, but actually there was a lot of truth in that statement, an enormous amount of truth, because Jerusalem is where the churches are, the local congregations are. But now, he is saying, uh, prepare to destroy Jerusalem. Jerusalem, hew ye down trees. And you know, that identifies with whom. Who are the trees that are going to be cut down? Remember the two witnesses? Are we, the believers are typified by a tree. And the Psalms were typified by a palm tree and other places by cedar trees. And But now... Satan is going to apparently win. Hew you down trees. And uh, again, just to refresh our memory, remember this, this terrible statement of Revelation 13, which is only one amongst many, in verse 7. As Satan, who is typified by 
the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. It was given unto him to make war with the saints. This is Revelation 13, verse 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. In other words, who hew you down trees? The Christians are no longer going to be able to remain. The true believers are not going to be able to remain in the churches. They've been hewn down. They've been uh, silenced. They've been driven out. Remember, we saw, uh, we looked at John 16 many times where it says they will drive you out of the synagogues in my name. They will kill you. And uh, that is what what God has in mind there. Hew you down trees. And, and uh, because the palace has to be destroyed, cast a mount against Jerusalem. That cast a mount is used in a number of places. And for example, in Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 8, we find a... Uh, uh, one place that is typical of how God uses uh, uh, this cast amount in Ezekiel 26 God is talking about Tyre and remember long ago we went through Ezekiel 28 and we saw that Tyre again was a synonym for the local congregation and uh, and uh, that it came under the wrath of God and here God says in verse 7 of Ezekiel 26, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. That is, I will bring against the churches Satan, Satan, uh, 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 a king of kings from the north, with horses and with chariots and with horsemen and com- companies and much people. He shall slay with the sword thy daughters in the field. He shall make a fort against thee and cast a mount against thee and lift up the buckler against thee. He shall set engines of war against thy walls and with his axes he shall break down thy towers and the god is is has set the example when nebuchadnezzar came against jerusalem he assaulted them these mounts are the are the towers that they build so that from them they can throw uh, uh, er- shoot arrows into the city uh, from them they can uh, they use them uh, in connection with their battering rams by which they hammer against the gates of the city in order to make penetration into the city. These are all the means that uh, the ancients used in, when they surrounded a city uh, to capture it. But the picture is, is that Satan is assaulting. Now, God is the one who has orchestrated this. Remember, Satan is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the locust. He is the, the, the demons and all that have come out of the pit. That is, God has loosed him so that, again, he can frustrate the gospel as it is preached in the churches and by means of the churches so that it will not be applied to the hearts of anyone, just as was the case before uh, the church age began when Christ preached and Satan was able to frustrate the gospel. We have the same thing happening again. And then in verse uh, 7, it goes on, As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she... so she casteth out her wickedness violence and spoil is heard in her before me continually in grief and wounds now when we read this again we can take the get the idea now this is a total exaggeration this is absolutely uh, too much it's too much you are claiming that God is teaching here that this is a tirade against the local congregations, that God is going to destroy them. And tell me, are they a fountain of, uh, of wickedness that flows out of them? Remember, water has to do with the gospel. And is, is it true that the gospel that is flowing out of the churches is a fountain of wickedness? 
Well, let me again remind us just of one truth, just one, just one. And I can name many others, but just one. When we think about the nature of the salvation program that is universally taught by the local congregations, almost totally, what kind of a salvation program is it? Well, we have to trust in God. God does the saving. He he is the one that has done the work to save us. So far, so good. But in order to do that, to have that, you have to reach out. You have to accept Christ. You have to get baptized in water. You have to do this. You have to do that. And 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 uh, and uh, even the faith by which God works through to save you is a faith that he has given you. And through that faith, he will save you. It is the instrument in God's hand to save us. Now, that is a fountain of wickedness. My, what an enormous charge. Because this is charging virtually all the congregation. A fountain of wickedness? Aren't they talking about salvation? Aren't they talking about the grace of God? Aren't they talking about faith? Aren't they talking about trusting in Him? How can you say that that's a fountain of wickedness? What a terrible thing. Well, let me remind us again of that, uh, of that little incident in Numbers 15 when the man picked up a few sticks on the Sabbath day. And God commanded that man to be stoned to death. We can never forget that. That that should be just imprinted upon our minds, that like uh, so we'll never forget it. Because this, the the keeping of the Sabbath day has everything to do with salvation. Uh, just as there was not to be any work done on the Sabbath day, so there's not to be any doctrine, any indicator of any kind that would suggest that something we did has caused us to become saved. And anything less than that, anything even minusculely less than that, uh, such as a man picking up a few sticks, leaves us still under the judgment of God. And therefore, the gospel we would have been bringing is a gospel of wickedness. It is a fountain of wickedness. It is a fountain that is producing a salvation program that is designed by men rather than by God. And, and uh, you know, again, remember, God does not forget any of this. He knows the sin. He knows the sin, and God is patient. Oh, my, later on we're going to get down to verse uh, uh, verse 8 where it says, Be thou instructed, and we're going to find how patient God is in all of this. But the fact is that, that finally the time has come when God says, It is enough. It is enough. And uh, and now he is going. To, uh, he wants a gospel to go out that is altogether faithful. I I I stand uh, amazed. I, I stand uh, humbled. I, I I I don't understand why this is, but somehow. Uh, and I can speak about family radio because I'm involved in family radio, and I know about that. I can't speak about other organizations out there because I don't I don't know anything about what they're doing they have to answer to God for what they're doing but I can speak about family radio and I think how God has laid it on our hearts not only in my heart but on the hearts of a great many people and an enormous number of listeners who are of this of the same mind that the gospel we have to preach has to be Christ alone. Christ alone did the saving, and we're not to have any any doctrine at all that suggests in any way that we have added something or that we have uh, uh, have uh, have uh, had a part in getting ourselves saved. It is altogether God's work, and and uh, this is. This is what God is speaking about as he speaks about a fountain of wickedness, that it has to be the gospel pure as possible. That's why we don't hesitate to admit 
We've made errors in the past. We want to be more and more accurate in the Word of God. Well, that's as far as we're going to get. We'll go on uh, from this, uh, in the middle of verse 7 in our next study. Until our next study, may the Lord richly bless you.